Uh, before we go into our panel discussion, uh, we'd like to take up just a quick offering. I'd like to in in encourage the deacons to come forward. Um, this offering actually is for the World Church Affirmation Sabbath uh, group, and this is a grassroots movement of dedicated Seventh-day Adventists who believe that as you have the messages you have heard today, that God, although the church may appear to fall, what will happen? It will not fall. And so, brothers and sisters, um, you can see what the World Church Affirmation Sabbath Committee stands for. The messages we gave today, also in your bulletin, there's 10 bullet points. Um, one is we affirm uh, the votes taken and, and that the Lord is leading the general conference. Amen. We, we affirm that God is still with his church. Amen. And so I'd just like to take, um, be, um, just have a quick prayer uh, before we take this offering. Um, if you're going to write a check, uh, please make it out to World Church Affirmation Sabbath. All right. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these powerful and encouraging messages we have heard today. Lord, help us to put our trust in you. Help us not to jump ship as we just heard, Lord, because there are popular messages out there. There are um, mega churches out there that seem so attractive, and even perhaps to our leaders, they might, their methods seem so attractive. But Lord, you have given us the spirit of prophecy. It is the testimony of Jesus. You have given us the final message that the world needs to hear. And so, Lord, we just ask that you bless these funds that are given today to continue to spread these present truth messages to the world. Lord, help us all to be ready for your soon coming and be with our church leaders especially, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to start our... Um question and answer session. And if you're in the overflow room and you have a question, we do encourage you to come um, to the upstairs room to ask your question. We do have a little bit of seat in the back and in the front um, if you have a question. All right. So if anyone has a question, they're welcome to raise their hand. Um, I have a concern or a question. This um, Sabbath school lesson, this quarterly, I had a lot of issues with it. They're quoting a lot of non avenous authors. And I didn't know what, as a church, what we should do about that if we feel there's preaching error in our Sabbath school lessons. Okay, so that's a good question. So how do, how do we handle um, the, just the topic of non-Adventist authors in general and um, things we might find perhaps questionable in the Sabbath school quarterly? I think I can answer just that first part as far as non-Adventist authors. I think, um, you know, Pilate asked Jesus a very important question. Does anyone remember what that question was? What is truth? And so, to me, if it's true, does it really matter the source? If it's emphasizing a point, um, I think so long as it's true, then, and credible, and can be verified, I personally don't have any objections to it. You know, Jesus was questioned by his disciples about the work someone else was doing over there. And Jesus said, he that is not against me is with me. And so that's how I would approach, approach that. Amen. Good answer. I like that. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Isaiah 820, right? To the law and to the testimony. Right. What about the second part of that question? Anyone want to be bold enough to touch that um, tactfully? The second part of the question was, um, how do we handle um, things that we might find questionable in the um, Sabbath school quarterly? Well, there um, have been in the past and there will likely be in the future things that we don't necessarily 
see eye to eye on in, in some of our literature. Uh, we have counsel from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy that if there's something we don't, uh, we take issue with, uh, talk to those people. Uh, let your voice be heard. Uh, write, call, um, and en if enough people see things the way you see it, I'm sure your voice will, will uh, be recognized. So it's, a, it's not something that's um, necessarily a terrible thing. One of the things that we um, is important within the Seventh-day Adventist Church is discussion. Uh, let's talk about things. Um, and this has been all through the history of our church is um, not everybody saw everything eye to eye. Uriah, Uriah Smith saw things one way. Uh, Jones and Wagner saw things another way. Butler saw things another way. Uh, but Ellen White encouraged them not to blast it through the public papers, but get together, sit down, and pray and discuss these things and come to a consensus so that when we present things publicly, we can all speak with the same voice. So I think there's a great, uh, one of the great things about the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that we can have opportunity to say, listen, I'm not, can you explain this to me or help me understand it? Or, you know, I see this is what the scriptures say. Uh, what do you have to back yours up? And, and so I think the, the great privilege we have within the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to openly be able to discuss things with one another so that we can all come to a consensus, consensus view and then present to the world uh, a, united, a united front. Amen. Thank you. Yes. I really enjoyed the uh, truth and the messages presented today and also um, earlier in the summer. Um, I just have a concern about the title, World Church Affirmation Sabbath. And I, I, I say that just because of the name world. Um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been considered a remnant church. We spread the gospel into all the world, but we are not one of the world. And we never, as a church, claim to, um, in prophecy, dominate the whole world as a one world church. Um, there's an ecumenical movement now with other denominations unifying with the Roman Catholic Church. And, um, and I talked with a Lutheran pastor earlier at a birthday party about um, Martin Luther's 500-year um, anniversary. And I asked him, I said, do you expect any um, special events that might be coming up October 31st or sometime this summer during the movement, because, um, and I mentioned the different ecumenical movements of churches uniting on common similarities and putting away differences. And he said, yes, I think it's very possible that there could be an announcement that there will be a unification of churches, a world church in essence. And so I just feel uncomfortable with the name world included in, in the title of this um, Okay, I understand. Report. Yes. Yeah, especially with a conversation with your friend. Um, so I um, appreciate that. I, um, if we can keep the questions a little short, that would be good. Um, so is there a concern because he's right? There is a world church movement, uh, but it's an ecumenical movement. Right, it's it's something different than what we heard today. But uh, do you have any concerns regarding that movement or or the name um, that we use, or is it wrong to use the word world? I guess would be part of the question. I think for me, um, we are a world church. We are a movement that is to take the gospel to the entire world, and so kind of hard to get around that. Um, I think we need to judge this movement by the content of the messages and not allow words to interfere um, with our mission, with how we're perceived. Amen. Yeah, the gospel of the kingdom will go to what? To the, all the world, and then the end shall come. And I, I think within the title, uh, what's understood 
is its Seventh-day Adventist world church. Um, so we are a global church. We are a world church, as uh, our sister here said. Um, but I think it's understood that it is the Seventh-day Adventist worldwide church as opposed to uh, a uh, you know, world being all denominations or... I believe it is, right? Is that true? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But that's sure. something likely to take up with the uh, people in charge. Thank you. Yeah. There are some uh, people in charge in the audience today, by the way, so they're, they're listening to your request, um, so it doesn't go on deaf ears. All right. Uh, can we take the next question? You know, it's, it's pretty plain to me when it says to the law and to the testament, if, if they do not uh, speak according to this word there, there is no light in them. So, um, and I've heard this by many, many uh, uh, preachers, and they'll quote people from other denominations, even, even uh, you know, from <clears throat> the Catholic Church, you know, they'll say this person was a godly man, and and, uh, and then they'll quote something that they said. But what does that say about where we are when it says to the law and to the testament, if they do not speak according to this word, there is no light. So what I'm saying is, can the devil be so brilliant to ease a little bit of falseness into these people? And when, and when <clears throat> fresh Christians come into our church and they hear that a certain pastor is quoting somebody, then they, they think, oh, I could read that book. And then and these young uh, converts are, are reading air by these people that, are, that, that the pastors are proclaiming that they had some good stuff, you know. But really, I, I believe that we have a message and we don't need to quote uh, other, other uh, pastors. You know, I mean, Martin Luther, that... That was before the Seventh-day Adventist Church came to effect. I mean, that was something that was coming. And, uh, but now, I'm not sure that we should really be quoting people that don't speak the whole truth that God said. Okay, sure. I just have a, a verse uh, that I was impressed with. Revelation uh, 14, uh, verse 4. It says, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. So, um, speaking of the 144,000, that they have a pure faith. And I think it is important to address those concerns. But it's also important to get a process going for that. In other words, so that there's no confusion and there's no negativity coming from it, but that there's a smooth process to address it. Anyone else want to make a comment? Dwayne? Um, I, I think, too, we, if, if I'm understanding the, the question of right, or maybe I will just say what I under, understand from it. Um, so I just preached the message, and all of us did. And it's quite possible if I had more time, I would have brought out other points and would have need to reference what I'm saying, either from, you know, the author or what have you. And so I, I don't know if it's, if we should say that we can't reference facts if we're delivering a point. I think what we should be careful of and avoid doing um, is we, we hear this word a lot, judging, right? It's such a cliche, but the reality is what I'm saying here is Matthew 7 says, um, for ev even so every good tree bring it forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bring it forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bring it not for good fruit is hewn down 
you shall know them by their fruits. I think, I think it's, if, if I am going to tell a story about creation, or, matter of fact, how many of you know of the name Edward Gibbon? Is he a Seventh-day Adventist? No. He was Christian? No. He was simply a historian. Yet, what do we know that we quote from of his works when we have a lot of evangelistic series? We quote from the fact that he speaks of Alexander the Great's just miraculous work of conquering this world. And he says there must have been some divine hand guiding him. And in many of our series, we emphasize this point that God even uses this man who doesn't believe in Christianity to make a point that he is God and that the Bible can be trusted. And so I would not venture to say I can't quote from him because that would take away from emphasizing that great point about God. So maybe I might mis be misunderstanding your question, but that's the, the position I hold. Go ahead. Uh, if we look at the, um, the great controversy, great controversy is full of quotes from um, non-Adventist uh, Christian people as well as, as historians. Uh, but in the introduction, she states that when I quote these, I'm not quoting them to use them as authority. But I'm just using their words because... I want to say the same thing, but they already said it so well. Why reinvent the wheel? And so she would use uh, uh, those quotes. So, uh, but yet your point is taken that we shouldn't be just using secular authors uh, in, a, in a fashion that is using them as authority. Uh, we should always use the Bible or the writings of the spirit of prophecy. Those are our authorities. Uh, these other things, these other things we quote, we want to show from history or show from, from uh, current events or something along those lines, that they are uh, fulfillments, if you will, of what the scriptures say, but not be used as authority to interpret the scriptures. Amen. All right. Uh, do you want to go to Brother Jerry? I think he, I think Just, we answered it pretty well already. <laughs> a real, a real, real quick, okay. quick thought. Um, when uh, Paul is writing uh, to Titus, uh, he's trying to point out that the church in, let's see, it's, uh, oh, the Cretans. Um, let's see, what is the name of that church? I can't place it right now. But the, the Cretans. Anyway, he says in chapter 1, Verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. So he quotes one of their own prophets to substantiate his position. And when we go to Acts 17, verse 28, it says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for are also his offspring. So he's telling them, even your own poets are saying this. So truth is truth. Truth is truth. And if somebody says it, we want to acknowledge it and encourage them to keep going to the truth. All right, I repent of uh, trying to cut you off there, Brother Jerry. That was a good answer. Thank you. All right, let's take the next question. Ellen White was showing a vision. She didn't want to write about it. Three weeks later, she was beckoned, you have to write. And she couched it by saying, if this were to happen, if there was a reformation. And she lists 12 points that they stated. This is in First Selected Messages 204, 205. And she listed 12 points specifically what would take place I don't know if you know those or if you want those read. Um, my question is, has that happened yet or is that future? 
Okay, so is the Reformation now or future? Or the re revival and Reformation? Is it happening now or should we wait for a future time for that to occur? Lord, send a revival and let it begin with me. Um, if that's not a good enough answer. Um, we, the latter rain began to fall when the 1888 message began to be preached in Ellen White in many different places, says the latter rain began to fall then. Uh, but it stopped because of our, our, uh, the way we, we dealt with it. But it's, it's us as a people that really need to accept the Laodicean message. And when we accept it and apply the remedy, then the revival will really take place. But it's any revival starts with the individual and then it will spread. We can't expect, generally revivals don't come from the top down, they generally come in individual prayer closets uh, if people begin to pray and revival happens and it grows. You know, Adventist Home tells us that on the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influences. And so I would believe the revival does begin in the home, as you said. Thank you. I'm, con I'm concerned about the uh, a thing called the One Project. It's been bannered around over recently over the last year. And then we heard that it has been abandoned or stopped. Can someone please tell us, tell, tell us where we are and why this thing hasn't stopped totally? Okay, first, perhaps we could give, a, somebody could give a description of what the one project is in case people don't know. And then um, I suppose the question is, why has it stopped? Should it be concern um, for God's church as well? The one, what is the one project? First, uh, first off, what is the one project? So everybody knows out there. The, the, one, the one project? Okay, so the one project is, um, <laughs> so the speakers are shaking their head. The one project is, is a movement, uh, it's, um, it's an Adventist movement um, that says their theme is Jesus All. And it's a very, uh, it, it started a few years ago, um, but um, some of the concerns are, um, it seems to be almost, um, it has almost spiritual um, um, ecumenical movements in it. Um, they have, um, you know, they'll have like prayer labyrinths and things like that. Um, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, spiritual, formation. spiritual formation. That's what I had spiritual. I just couldn't think of formation. Thank you. Spiritual formation aspects to it. And um, recently it did um, stop, although they have some meetings that are concluding um, early next year, I believe. Um, but um, is anyone here familiar with it? Uh, well, as far as I know, they, uh, they have some f a few meetings that they're continuing, but they're putting it on hold or on pause, or so which leads one to think that it might be coming out in a new iteration, uh, but we're not sure. Yeah, we're just not sure on that. Brother Jerry, you want to say? Yeah, one thing comes to mind. Uh, I remember... I'm not real familiar with what's going on within the church, but the, with the one project. But I recall a while back reading about it that there is kind of in the world, uh, there's a movement to what they call the one, kind of replaces God. It's the one that everybody can agree with. And some of the new translations now capitalize the word one quite often. And uh, they're trying to make it sort of synonymous, but almost replacing Jesus in importance. That's the thing I remember as I went through and studied it. And I've noticed that we're finding the word one capitalized more and more. So it just doesn't look good to me as I look at it because it appears to be taking away from Christ. 
but yet they can get us into it because at first we're going to think, well, they're talking about Jesus. But then when you go into like the Theosophic Society and things like that, there's always a replacement for Christ. Well, the one project they claim to put Christ first, um, that's their theme, Jesus all. But um, one of the things is they tried to downplay the three angels' messages. And perhaps you've heard that in church. Why were you talking about these beasts in Revelation and, and things like that? Why not just preach Jesus? What would you say to that? Why not, why not just preach Jesus? Why, why preach the three angels' messages? Why talk about, you know, the Antichrist and all those things? Well, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the whole of the Bible is the truth. You can't leave portions of it out because it doesn't suit your emotion. I think um, uh, this movement is based on a feel-good movement. Um, and that's very dangerous because we are told that we, uh, we need to put on the helmet of salvation. Uh, we are saved through our brains, uh, through our connection with Christ as we see him through the word, the entire word. And so we can't leave out the three angels' messages. We can't leave out the beast, especially in the times we're living in. So it's obviously an attack from the enemy. Um, even though it looks good, it sounds good, but that's how the enemy works. And so, the, you know, um, so long as we are grounded in, in our message, uh, the three angels' messages, and we're seeking spirit of prophecy in the word of God, we will recognize false movements as they come up. In uh, the last book of the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so he personally says, I sent my angel to tell you these things, and I want you, John, to send it out to all the churches. And then I want you to, you know, basically take it to the world. So the things in the book of Revelation are the message of Jesus. So if we're preaching the message of Jesus, we will be preaching the things contained in the book of Revelation. Amen. Christ is found in every doctrine. Amen. All right. Let's take our next question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll do in the back end yeah. then, Dr. Fleck, if that's okay, okay. sorry. My thing is, I, I get from the very title of this thing, <laughs> is that, or to me, the concern is larger than this small stuff in a way we're talking about, but the fact that entire conferences or are going what we would call perhaps a liberal way or thing. Now, does this world Sabbath reform here, is that, wouldn't that be the ultimate, a, a cha a, will it, is it in the future to do something about this as opposed to, you, know, you, you understand what I mean, I'm talking about big time, I'm not talking about little churches. Mm -mm. Good, I, I'm not following your question a little bit, I, are you saying, is this the final Apostasy, is that your question, or I'm not I'm not Well, following. what's Sorry. the organization f for? I mean... What's this organization for? Why? There are big things happening, right? I mean, even... I mean, I even get the gist that okay. our local conference is not happy about this. Now, are we trying to affect those conferences? Wouldn't it be... Are you asking what, what is doing? the point of the World Church Affirmation? Kind Bible? of. Right. All right. Uh, good question. That's a very good question. Why, why are we here? What is, what is the point of these meetings? Um, why are we here today? What, are, what is the point of the World Church Affirmation Sabbath meetings in, in, the, in the scheme of the larger picture? Well, I, I just will say what I think it means to me is the World Church in the general conference session took a vote, and they voted on the issue of ordaining women. And we are standing with them in that vote. We believe that's a biblical vote. We're standing along with them in that. We want them to know we're standing with them, and we will continue to stand on that position because we believe it's biblical. So world affirmation, we are affirming 
the vote that the General Conference took when they were in session. That's why we're here, to let it be known we stand in solidarity with them. And I think to the, to the larger uh, position, we just want, we love our church. This is God's church, the apple of his eye. And as, we, uh, as I read one of the quotes there, anything that someone does against the church is considered treachery by God because God gave his only son for us. And so anything that affects the church uh, is very, very personal to God. So the reason that we're here is we want to affirm not just a world organization, but also we want to affirm God. This is the church he died for. This is the church that he's raised up. We, we stand behind it. We're standing behind our Lord and Savior as well. And there's a real important decision that has to be made in October uh, with the General Conference as they, what do they call it, the Fall Council. It's got a different name now, but basically they're going to come together and they're voting on some important issues, what to do if the whole church doesn't go along with the world church decision. So we want to pray for them. This is a serious time, and we're going to ask that God will direct in their decision-making that it will be of God, but also that they'll be strong enough to follow their convictions and not be tempted to take an easier way out, because that is the human way. That is the human way. But God would have them be strong. And let's be praying for them that God's will will be done and that the men and women that are involved in all of these decisions making, decision, decisions that have to be made, that God will lead them and they will have the strength to follow his leading. All right, Dr. Flack, go ahead. Now, this question has to do with, uh, I'd like to ask the panel, what do you do? What's the best way, biblical way, Christian way, to deal with heresy within our conference, even at the highest level, such as at the university? Uh, you know, first we had spiritual formation, and then you have the emerging church, which are just a group of a lot of different churches that are uh, embracing spiritual formation. But now it's advanced to a new level, and it's called the Post-Emergent Convergence Spirituality Group. And so Walla Walla University has now adopted that, and they are now a Convergence Spirituality, Post-Emergent Convergence Spirituality Group member. And in their charter, it says that they don't want to have any differences of doctrine. We don't think we're any better than anybody else. Uh, we don't have anything to offer that anybody else does in any other church. We don't do proselytizing. They've adopted this as their, basically as a charter. So how do you, how do you deal with this? This is a serious, that's my alma mater. How, how's it, how can you deal with this in a Christian way? Now, or, was or, that or, the article on Fulcrum 7? Yes. Um, because didn't, wasn't that mentioned that the, um, they, they said they, they weren't sure how they got on that website? Is that correct, that anyone could fill out the form? So I'm not, I'm not sure we want to... Yeah, they've denied it. So I don't believe Walla Walla is actually joining them. They've denied spiritual that. formation and all that lots of times and, before, so that doesn't mean anything. But uh, to us, uh, I think the question is more general and more even more important is how do we, how do we um, confront heresy? Perhaps we even see things that are not proper in our universities. Well, um, yeah, in a general sense, in a general sense. That question. Um, you know, we have in our church... Um, constituencies and um, different meetings where decisions are being made. Um, I like the um, progress of the Reformation in, in Germany or the progress of the Reformation in total. I think that's the title of the great controversy chapter where she speaks of um, after the Reformation had, was get, gaining success how these guys came in and claimed they had the Holy Spirit and just, we don't need the Bible and let, let us just, you know, direct you based on our spirit. And Luther was just pained by all of this. But the approach Luther took towards reform 
and changes that needed to happen in, in the church, I believe it is, is the same that we should take as well. By pen and voice, we are to um, let our concerns be heard. I have a document. It's interesting that you, you mentioned that, docu Dr. Fleck. I have a, a document um, where I don't, I, I don't know who the, uh, the group was that put it together, but their concern was um, a couple of years ago regarding the, the things that were happening down in Walla Walla. And they titled it, they, they CC'd or carbon copied um, Elder Falkenberg Jr., um, Max Torkelson II, Elder Max Torkelson, and Elder Ted Wilson. And this letter stated their concerns and it was presented, I'm, I, I, I will have to assume, presented to the the appropriate individuals at the appropriate time. Now, what happens if, you know, the desired outcome we want doesn't happen? We have given our voice, we have written, we have shared our concerns. I believe what we are left with is the awesome privilege of prayer, to have God then to intercede with God. We're told that Luther would pray three hours a day when there was a conflict, there was something big going on. And I believe if we believe we're in the last days, we should be more earnest in prayer than was Luther in his day. Because Jesus is coming soon. Again, I believe that we can, the one thing that we must not do is, I'll say this, take on the zeal of Zehu, Jehu actually, because she counsels against that kind of a spirit where it's reformation by force. And we want to avoid that spirit because this church belongs to God. And it's not a do nothing with that statement. We, you have already done what you can. You have written a letter or you've shared your concerns. After that point, we must learn to exercise faith in God. Amen. Um, you spoke of Jehu and... and uh... In that same story, God raised up a man by Hazael, and he was to do a certain work as well, and Ellen White comments upon about him, and uh, she says, God will arouse his people, and if other means fail, he will allow heresy to come into the church. So in a certain sense, we're the problem, uh, because... We haven't consecrated ourselves. We are Laodicea. And we haven't consecrated ourselves to the extent that God can work a powerful reformation through us, pour out his Holy Spirit, and we can go home. Because we've just kind of laxed around, God is trying to arouse us. And we've just said, not ready yet. And so he says, okay. I'm going to allow heresy to come in to get you studying God's word. And this is where we are right now. So we can cause it to stop. And the way we get it to stop is to get on our knees and to reconsecrate ourselves to God, get right with him. And God will signal that by the pouring out of his spirit and we'll be done with this and we'll go home. Amen. Sister Liz, you have something? Uh, there is counsel also in testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, 165. The best way to deal with error is to present the truth, which is what we're doing here today, and lead wild ideas to die for want of notice. Contrasted with truth, the weakness of error is made apparent to every intelligent mind. The more the erroneous assertions of opposers and of those who rise up among us to deceive souls are repeated, the better the cause of error is served. The more publicity is given to the suggestions of Satan, the better pleased is his satanic majesty. Also, we must remember that it's been foretold that God's people are going to rise up as an army. Song of Solomon 6.10 says, Who is she that looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? I believe that this could be a start of that movement. This is a movement of lay people, as we said, um, as it should be. And uh, if we want to fight error, let's do it with truth. Let's take another question. 
Brief question. Um, first, though, a point of clarity for a previous questioner. Um, they referred to a reformation that Satan was trying to bring about that is recorded in First Selected Messages 204 and 205, which states in that statement that there would be a reformation and what it would consist of were to take place. Uh, books of a new order would be written. A new system of philosophy would be introduced. The Sabbath would be lightly regarded. And that that structure, that reformation and reorganization that would be built would be swept away. And his question was, is, do you believe that has happened yet or not? Uh, my question is also, um, from all the presentations that have been made today, um, could you clarify for me, um, do you believe the church to be the faithful souls as one presenter read from Acts 11? Or do you believe the church to be the General Conference Corporation of Seventh-day Adventists? Okay, first, I want to say thank you for the clarity on that. Um, so, yeah, what is, what is the church? Is that the question, right? Mm -hmm. What is the church? Is it the corporate body, or is it the people, or what, what is the church? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, ten minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, I will simply say, how many of us own the testimonies? How many of us own the selected messages? Mm -hmm. Go to book three, very first chapter, what is the church? And because the answer to that question is multifaceted and the time that we have right now doesn't permit to get into the, all that answer. I, I can give you an answer, but that will be in part. And then there'll be a lot more questions. But let me just say this. We are told very clearly that, according to Revelation 12, 17, that the remnant are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, very clearly in Selected Messages, book three, she says, in the last days, God's church will be organized. So it won't be this independent group of people going here, there, and everywhere. It will be organized. Now, if you ask me what does organization mean, that's where we get into all-night session. So I trust that each one of us could pick up the selected messages, go through that chapter, what is the church, and I pray that you will prayerfully read that, and the Lord will give you that answer. Now, we had this conversation there was another document you read from the General Conference that you said was really good regarding this as well. Was that right? Yes. Yes, but that was actually to... Oh, that's, this is another topic. That's actually dealing with um, votes at the General Conference that may, we may not agree with. What do we do? Okay. But All right. I'm that's not a different person. topic. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Now, um, we did want to hit the other question a little bit about... Um, you know, it talks about books of a new order being written, um, a false revival. Are we already in that period? That's a tough question. Sorry, but I don't want to neglect the questions. <laughs> the audience answered already. Okay, we'll, we'll take the audience's word for this. All right. Another question? So you gave a very good and clear explanation of why this organization exists. My question is, would this organization exist, and should we be rah-rah, support the world church, if the San Antonio vote had gone the opposite way? Mm. A great question, sister. <laughs> it's kind of a what-if question, a little bit, but go ahead. You know, it's Dwayne. kind of a what-if question, but it, it is... It's true, though. It's it could, true. It could have happened. And it, it probably has happened in the past. Right where decisions have been made, we're not always going to agree with everything. But I will say this: what you know, I guess your question is why does this this movement exist? And I think the answer has already been given. But particularly, what happens if you know the decision was to um, allow divisions or unions? I think it is to you know ordain as they see fit. Would we have this movement? You know. A couple of us at the Newport Church have, have discussed this um, because the tendency is when, when decisions are made that maybe contradicts the, the Bible or even the spirit of prophecy, 
the natural thing to do is to say, I am out of here. I'm going to leave the church. And again, Revelation 2, Revelation 3, no eighth church. So we have to stay here. That's where this document comes in, where the General Conference Secretariat put together the um, document on church unity and governance just before they were going to have the annual council, which was, I guess, um, abridged before they actually um, presented it. But in that document, it, you know, she was addressing a local issue where she says, even if they are wrong, yield. What? You're all quiet. <laughs> she did. So did Paul. Hmm? Remember Paul? And so we have to look at why we are here as Seventh-day Adventists. We have an individual responsibility. Let's say everyone decided to leave the church because a decision didn't go the right way, at least the way we think it should. Where would the voices be? Who would stand? So we need folks, and we just heard that heresy comes in for, in order to wake us up. So when these things happen, and if a vote was to go contrary, then we must put into action and use those avenues that are available to us to bring about change. But if we abandon ship, then we have no voice, and the church languishes. Another question, I, or Brother Jerry, sorry, go ahead. You know, we have to follow our conscience. We cannot betray our conscience. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. So it's a very serious question. And uh, I just want you to think long and hard about it. It's very serious. I'm not saying we leave the church for different decisions that we disagree with, but if it's a biblical principle, I can't lend my support to a biblical principle, uh, the, something that's not a biblical principle. Several years ago, it, it got really bad, and one of the, uh, some issues came up, and, and it was really bad, and my wife and I talked, what, what do we do? And we realized that the Bible studies were still teaching everything we believed. It was teaching in harmony with the Bible. Uh, the evangelists that we heard were still teaching what we believed in. We could support that. We could support almost everything. And so we dealt with it for a time the way we were convicted we had to deal with it. And our conscience was clear. And then as time went on, those things cleared up. And then we could come back in a little fuller support and a little fuller way. But never think that because man does certain things, you follow man against your conscience. You cannot do it. And that's what makes the church strong. It makes the church strong. The church is the truth and those who adhere to the truth as they see it. But for light things, no. To leave just because this or just because that, no, it's very serious. But that's why it's prayerful. And don't betray your conscience or what you see to be the truth. God will lead you as to what to do to maintain that and to stay in harmony. Now, I don't think anybody's saying that you should do that. I don't think that's what any of us are saying. But we can understand that nobody will ever tell me that you go into this building because it says over the door, Seventh-day Adventist, and they're teaching abominable things. I'm not going in there. That's all I can tell you. I don't care what name they have over the door. I'm not going in. And I would assume that you would all do the same thing. So we better pray about each of these issues and let it be known that the leaders we put in there, we're not following them. We're following God's leading, and he's raised us up with a message, and we will be true to the message God has given us. So I just wanted to share um, one thing to add to that. So um, Elijah um, was sent to 
Israel. That was an apostasy, yes? Was it the church? Um, I'm assuming the 7,000 were where? In Israel, in the church. Elijah just didn't know about it. God sent him to the church to work within the church and behalf of the church to bring about change. Needed change in conformity to a thus saith the Lord. So he really could have said, I am not even, because these guys were saying Baal sends the rain. Baal is God. And this was the Seventh-day Adventist church of old. (laughs) But he went to them. And he preached to them. And he ministered unto them. Until God, by a mighty working, brought about reform. He didn't give up. And the 7,000 were in there working as well. We're not told what they were doing. But I'm, I'm simply saying to us, if we have that flight mode, when things hit the fan, so to speak, then what does it say about our commitment to our Savior? We should stay with the ship. We should work and do all that we can to bring about reform, primarily by the way we live our lives. Um. I just want to remind us that um, in Matthew chapter 13, where uh, the Bible speaks of the tares and the wheat, the tares are the ones that are removed um, at the end of time. And we know that Ellen White also says that the tares are the embodiment of error. So the error is not going to remain. The wheat is going to remain. And Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. So we don't need to worry much about that. God is in control. We have um, just a few minutes left, so we can take maybe one or two more questions, but I ask you to keep it short if you can. Thank you. We have another question. On page 475 of Testimonies to Ministers, we're told that somebody is to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And we really need to contemplate what was Elijah's message and what did he do? And yes, the church was apostate. And yes, you are walking into Seventh-day Adventist churches. And yes, they are teaching apostasy in, in the churches. And, and we're also told that uh, the hellish torch of Satan is being preached from the pulpit. So to think that there's not apostasy in our churches is, is um, to be somewhat naive. And we need to know that, but we do need to understand and, and believe what, what is told us when she says somebody's to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Because the church has put in the back of that book that that was Sister White, but it clearly wasn't Sister White. Because she said when he comes, and she's not a he, and she wasn't talking about herself. So we need to know that, you know, Elijah's purpose, she, we're told that, the purpose of the Elijah message is to um, clarify and bring to our attention the wrongs that have entered the church since 1844, and that's directly from the Spirit of Prophecy. So um, all these wrongs that have entered in since 1844 are going to be corrected by God. We can be a part of that movement, or we can not be a part of that movement. It's up to us. Okay, that was the statement, but do you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say in Ezekiel chapter 9, um, God tells the angel with the writers to go through the city and mark those who are uh, sighing and crying for the abominations done in the land. Uh, When Sister White comments on that, she talks about those people that are crying and sighing are crying and sighing on their knees because of what's happening within the church and the church is going after the world. So in this, yes, there is that element. Uh, And yet at the same, while we see there are tears uh, within the church, um, we're not to try to pull up the tears. 
because if we pull up the tares, we may along with them pull up some of the wheat. Mm -hmm. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, the reapers will um, reap the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, and gather the wheat into the garner. So while we need to rise and cry out and show my people their sins, uh, we're not seeing the church proper or the, the um, as we see here in, in, in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter, what is it, chapter 3 here, that the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And so that's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. We're not to see the church and the teachings of the church, etc., as in apostasy. Yes, there may be some people, and likely are, apostate within the church. There are tares in the church. But we are not to label the whole church because there's a tear here and there. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. I agree. All right, this needs to be the last question, or uh, if anyone has one. If not, I'd like to um, ask Pastor Jim if he would just have a closing prayer for us, if that would be okay, and then um, perhaps pray for our food as well. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the spiritual food that we've had here this afternoon, for the messages that we've heard. We're thankful, Lord, for each one who has come and the questions that have been addressed here. And we pray that you'll continue to keep us um, seeking after you and your will for our lives, your will for the church. Lord, we are living in perilous times, and we need to have your spirit guiding not only here in the local level, but all the way to the top. And so, Lord, may your spirit come upon our leaders. May you move upon our hearts. May you help us to follow in the truth as it is in Jesus. And may we recognize that you are going to go with your church through to the very end. And so, Lord, we thank you for those encouraging words and we pray that now as we depart, that you would continue to watch over us, our individual churches. And at last, may we all be able to look up and hear from you. Well done, good and faithful servants. We look forward to that day soon. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.